members of Capital A, I will be very grateful to say to thank you to all of you for being here today. I think we're having a great event. Uh, I'd like to just say particular thanks, of course, to the Capital A team, but also to the DNB team that we have been working together so well for so long. I'd like, like to invite uh, Ted Zarek to uh, address you. Ted, thank you for being a, a long-time partner. We've done this event together for so long, and uh, I'm delighted to see, frankly, the quality of the speakers, the, the quality of their turnout. We have uh, a lot of great uh, one-on-ones, uh, so thank you to everybody for being with us. I'd also like to acknowledge Cassandra Sire of the New York Stock Exchange. We have uh, uh, another long-standing partnership, and thank you for being with us. And then I will introduce uh, Nikos Tsakos and Mark Ross, but Ted, if you don't mind, come to the podium. The floor is yours. Uh, so this is really going to be brief because we have a little, little progression here of speakers. Uh, and I'm just going to reiterate uh, to you, Nicholas, uh, our, our thanks for all of your organization of a, another really good quality event. I thought the, uh, the panels this morning were, were really good quality, and I think the ones we have scheduled for the afternoon equally so. I think we've got a very interesting uh, couple of speakers here during the course of the next few minutes, uh, which, which I look forward to. We have a lot of challenges in the world today. Uh, they became evident again over the weekend. Um, how that impacts shipping, it, it normally does, um, as, it, as it does everything and all of us. Um, I think shipping is, as I said earlier today, it's, it's, it's never been better positioned to handle the challenges that are still coming its way. Uh, but the journey ahead is still, is still long. Uh, and, and there's, um, I think, a, you know, a continuing and growing tension between the energy, energy security and, and the energy transition imperatives. Um, and how that plays out will, will definitely impact this industry and the, and, the, and the people that are sitting around the tables here running, running the companies. I think we all look forward to being part of that journey and uh, we'll continue to support this, this industry uh, along the way. And I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ted, thank you. And dear friends, I'd like to invite now Nikos Tsakos to, uh, to the podium. Uh, I think Nikos does not need an introduction, but I will simply say that uh, besides thanking him as Captain Link for being our global sponsor, for being today also the lunch sponsor, among other things, Nikos has the unique milestone today of celebrating uh, 30 years of being a publicly listed company, the oldest publicly listed company. And um, he will tell you that um, it was really this uh, October 10, 1993, that uh, you started trading on the uh, Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, and here we are 30 years later. Uh, so we're delighted to have you. And by the way, I'd like to remind you that um, besides being the founder, CEO, and president of Chaco Energy Navigation, Nikos has been a great uh, statesman for the industry. He served uh, two terms uh, as chairman of Intertanko. And so he has uh, really a great um, industry footprint. Nico, thank you for being with us today. And he's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Actually, another reason I'd like to thank uh, Nick is I use his very good graces trying to convince Mark to be our keynote speaker. So thank you that the teamwork paid off. Thank you, Nick. Too many Nicks here. It's like my big Greek fat wedding. Nick, Nick, and Nick. But, uh... Well, uh, when you are called the oldest public listed company, I think uh, it's time for retirement. So please call us the longest uh, running one instead uh, of the oldest. Well, yes, it, uh, it's been 30 years, 30 exciting years. I think uh, what started as a, a thesis uh, from, uh, from college and, and business school has developed uh, to where we are today, uh, having uh, in... Uh, accumulated two and a half billion dollars in uh, net uh, income in a very cyclical industry. Have, uh, we were discussing about dividends before with our analyst and uh, we have paid 750 million uh, in dividends and annualized five and a quarter return. I mean, nothing, nothing uh, too exciting. We're not here to bet 
the, the, the ships or the house uh, overnight, uh, but we like continuity. Uh, we are here because of uh, continuity and our long relationships with a lot of people like you uh, here today. And of course, like people uh, like our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, with whom we have a very close uh, business and, uh, and friendship relationship. We have been, he has actually been with Chevron longer than uh, 10 has been around. So uh, I think uh, you must have been close to 35 years now with your uh, alma mater, <laughs> Chevron, and we are looking forward to hear a lot about that. Uh, we came very close in cooperating. Uh, him and his lovely wife, uh, Jennifer, represent uh, the new uh, face of oil companies. Uh, it was the first time through his uh, chairmanship for OKINF uh, and uh, my time at Intertango, as Nick uh, said, that we brought uh, charterers and uh, owners together in issues of uh, sec security, safety, and, uh, and environmental protection. And um, he is a graduate of the fa very famous uh, Berkeley University in chemical engineering and MBA from there. And uh, also at the same time, uh, another common thread, we are both now empty nesters since both my, all my, mo both my daughters are, are studying at Columbia University and you have all the kids out of the house. And this will give us more time for, to do many more things in, in business and fun, I hope. And with that, I would like uh, to introduce uh, Mark and listen uh, uh, much more from you. Thank you. Well, Nick, uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome and introduction. And, and Nicholas, another Nick, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here to present to such a distinguished and no doubt very hungry group today. Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and privileged to be here with all of you. As, as Nick mentioned, my name is Mark Ross, uh, and I've been with Chevron 33 years, so don't exaggerate. 33 years, and during that time, I've held a variety of jobs. I've been in our upstream, downstream, and midstream businesses. For a brief period of time, I actually had a job uh, for Chevron a few blocks from here as a foreign exchange trader. So I've done all sorts of different things, but for the majority of my Chevron career, I've been in our shipping business, and for the past eight going on nine years, I've had the honor and privilege of being president of Chevron Shipping Company. Uh, I was mentioning at our table, uh, people know Chevron but don't know it well, in part because we don't have uh, much of a presence here in New York or the Northeast and, and really never did. So I, I thought I'd begin by giving you a brief history of Chevron and Chevron Shipping Company. Uh, we have a very long and storied history, but I do promise to keep this short. Chevron traces its roots back uh, to 1879 and the oil fields of California. So that's a bit of an education for you. Yes, California does have oil fields, many of which are still producing for Chevron today. Our first refinery was built in the San Francisco Bay Area and to transport and move uh, oil from our production in Southern California to San Francisco, ships were soon required. and. Uh, our first steel hull tanker, the George Loomis, was launched in 1895, and our shipping company was born at Chevron. Uh, the George Loomis, not really impressive by today's standards, uh, approximately 50 meters, bow to stern, carrying capacity, cargo, maybe 6,500 or so barrels, and came with what was a hefty price tag at the time of $100,000. Fast forward to today, though, and after many, many mergers and acquisitions uh, over the past 140 years, and Chevron Corporation is now active in 75 different countries, uh, has approximately 40,000 employees around the globe, uh, and is the third largest integrated energy company. We don't say oil, energy company now, uh, by market capitalization just behind uh, Saudi Aramco and our American friends at ExxonMobil. Chevron's primary objective is to deliver higher returns, lower carbon, and superior shareholder value in any business environment. And as for Chevron Shipping Company, we grew from that 
initial $100,000 investment back in 1895 to actually operating a very large fleet of oil tankers. In fact, uh, back when I was a, a young ship charterer and oil trader, obviously a very long time ago, uh, Chevron Shipping Company operated the largest tanker fleet in the world, uh, which at times uh, included over 30 VLCCs and ULCCs in our fleet. Uh, today we operate a, a much more modest and modern fleet of 30 ships total, in total, uh, including uh, oil tankers, LNG carriers, and we operate a Jones Act fleet as well. And by continuing to operate ships ourselves, so we have maintained that internal marine organizational capability to support Chevron's 70 plus marine terminals and other offshore and marine assets around the world. However, now we leave most of Chevron shipping requirements to high quality third party shipping companies like yours, Nikos. Uh, so in addition to our, our 30 ship operated fleet, at any given time we have another 150 or so ships on time charter uh, moving uh, Chevron's oil products and gas around the world. And lastly and most importantly, we are extremely proud of our industry leading safety and environmental performance. Will our operations of yesterday and today foreshadow where we aspire to be in the future? So, so let's talk about the future uh, of both the maritime industry and energy transportation and how both individually and as an industry we will write the next chapters in our stories. And I'm going to talk about three of those chapters today. And I'm going to frame the rest of my discussion around a trio that I call the three Ds, uh, which are all near and dear to Chevron Shipping Company. And those are diversity, decarbonization, and digitalization. I'm going to start with diversity, or, or more completely, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. At Chevron, we recognize that people are our most important resource. Uh, we believe the most creative solutions emerge in an environment where diverse voices are heard, bold thinking is valued, and people grow into their fullest potential. However, the, the, the primary diversity challenge uh, facing our industry today is less uh, around culture and nationality than it is around gender. As I think uh, you're all aware, the maritime sector has been male-dominated for literally thousands of years. Uh, a BIMCO 2021 report uh, states that women still only represent slightly over 1% of the global seagoing workforce. As demand for skilled mariners increases, in increases, tapping into half the world's population is absolutely critical. However, encouraging women to pursue careers in maritime, both at sea and ashore, requires addressing biases, providing equal opportunities for training and advancement as well. And while we still have a long ways to go, I'm proud that the female mariner representation in the Chevron fleet has grown significantly in recent years, and we've also had numerous female officers uh, advance all the way to the rank of master in our fleet. However, none of us can do it alone. To seize this opportunity, collaborative efforts are required. Shipping companies, industry organizations, and governments must work together to create policies to promote gender diversity. At Chevron, we are proud to support the Women Offshore Foundation, whose mission is to advance women into maritime careers. We are also actively participating in the Global Maritime Forum's All Aboard Alliance. The All Aboard Alliance's key principle is ensuring DEI accountability and creating and maintaining a culture of equity and belonging, whether at sea or ashore. Along those lines, uh, while both gender and cultural diversity are important, they need to go hand in hand with inclusion. And it goes without saying uh, that it requires a workplace completely free from harassment. Therefore, I would like to challenge us all to invest in diversifying our fleets by adding to the approximately 24,000 women seafarers currently sailing around the globe today. Diverse thinking, diverse people, diverse backgrounds are all needed to tackle the second D in my trio, decarbonization, or we refer to it as Chevron as lower carbon. 
In this area, we know we need to make a very real, tangible difference, not just talk. As economic growth drives greater overall demand, investment in lower carbon technologies will also grow. And the maritime uh, industry plays a very pivotal role in international trade, as I think you heard on some of the panels, connecting countries and continents. Today, over 90% of world trade is transported across our oceans and seas. However, the shipping industry is also a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. According to a 2020 IMO report, approximately 3% of global CO2 emissions can be attributed to ocean-going ships. And World Economic Forum report states that if global shipping were a country, it would be the sixth largest producer of greenhouse gas emissions, with only the US, China, Russia, India, and Japan emitting more CO2 than the world's shipping fleet. Chevron believes the future of energy is lower carbon and that multiple solutions will be required to reduce emissions across the transportation sector. However, it's no secret that the maritime industry faces significant challenge, challenges in its quest to lower its carbon footprint Transitioning to lower carbon fuels or alternative propulsion will be both complex and costly. Despite these challenges, there are promising opportunities ahead. And as with diversity, collaboration between governments, industry players, and research institutions will be critical to accelerate and drive innovation in propulsion technologies, energy efficient designs, and alternative fuels. Time is of the essence, though, and I can assure you that at Chevron Shipping Company, we are full steam ahead. I think the first thing that every shipping company needs to do is to fully understand what their emissions profiles are today. For us, joining and being active in the Sea Cargo Charter was an important catalyst to drive Chevron Shipping's understanding of our own emissions. The Sea Cargo Charter, as many of you know, ensures consistent data collection across all marine transportation. It also changed how we charter ships for many of you, making carbon intensity now an important part of our decision-making process. And I'm happy to report that our overall fleet emissions were approximately 20% below the ambitious target that we set for ourselves back in 2022. Looking forward, we're also making significant investments to our existing fleet. As an example, to help reduce the carbon intensity of our LNG fleet, we're adding air lubrication, reliquifaction, and multi-stage compressors to all our own ships. These modifications will reduce cargo boil off, lower fuel consumption, and increase volumes of cargo delivered. We're also partnering with numerous industry groups. With the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, we're conducting ammonia studies and doing biofuels testing. Uh, the biofuels being tested are, be, are produced by Chevron and we're testing them both on our ships and third party ships. And to date we've completed well more than uh, 100 successful biofuel bunker deliveries in Singapore alone. And in the US, Chevron is purposely developing our marine biofuel offerings from renewable waste-based feedstocks so as to not compete for food crops. With the Global Maritime Forum, we're participating in both short-range and long-range efforts. Uh, one short-range measure is trying to make just-in-time arrival uh, become shipping industry practice. As I think everyone in this room is aware, some ships spend a significant amount of their time waiting in Anchorage uh, before being called into terminals. If this waiting time is eliminated, it can be converted to reduce voyage speeds, uh, which would have an immediate impact on lowering emissions. We have adopted, uh, in the lower carbon space, uh, we're also working with other major shipping companies, including Mitsui OSK Lines and the Angela Cousas Group. Uh, we partnered with MOL to uh, advance the technical and commercial feasibility of transporting uh, liquefied CO2 from Singapore to permanent storage locations offshore Australia. 
finding solutions to transporting and storing CO2 will make the world's existing energy production both cleaner and lower in carbon. While with the Angela Cousas Group, uh, we are furthering our understanding of energy of the future, uh, which includes the, the transportation of both uh, hydrogen and ammonia. Safety is always the num number one priority for Chevron shipping, though. So we're also in parallel conducting studies on the safety and adoption of ammonia as a maritime fuel and the fuels, risks, and challenges uh, associated with uh, the transportation of ammonia, hydrogen, and CO2 at scale. The thought I would like to leave you with before moving on to my third and final D is that every single lower carbon initiative that I've mentioned was undertaken at Chevron within the last 12 months. And with the global shipping market on its continued growth trajectory, every opportunity to lower our carbon intensity matters. Uh, with investment, innovation, and most importantly, action, our industry can rise to the challenge. Now on to my last D in the trio, uh, digitalization. At Chevron, we innovate in smarter and faster ways. Uh, digitalization is helping us to accomplish that. Rapid technological advancements in digitalization are also reshaping the maritime industry. This transformative digital journey is not without its challenges and will require a cultural change. Uh, for example, thorough training of maritime professionals will be required to adapt to these new technologies. However, the prize is huge. Uh, safety at sea can be greatly improved through digitalization as advanced sensor systems, remote monitoring, and autonomous technologies uh, can help contribute to both safer navigation and early detection of potential risks. Data-driven decision-making will also lead to significant improvements in operational efficiency. Uh, the combination of digitalization and installed energy devices have the potential to significantly reduce fuel consumption on the entire existing fleet of ocean-going vessels. This will obviously reduce operating costs. Uh, much more importantly, though, it will result in more efficient operations that are aligned with our industry's lower carbon goals. At Chevron Shipping, we're already seeing how digitalization and data-driven decision-making can accomplish this. We have established an op integrated operations center to drive smarter, more transparent decision-making. It's still early days, but our IOC has already delivered improved operational performance and significant fuel savings across our fleet. And as with the other 2Ds, we are not going it alone in the digital space. Uh, we've been working with ABS WaveSite to track and report our emissions uh, more quickly than ever before. We've also been utilizing uh, Blue Water's BOSS platform to evaluate uh, real-time speed, weather, and operational conditions in order to optimize overall fleet performance. Uh, digitalization will continue to support Chevron in meeting global energy demands while also lowering our carbon intensity. And in closing, uh, creating innovative solutions to complex problems is critical for both Chevron and the maritime industry. And the three challenges that I have addressed today, the three Ds, will require new technologies, new ways of thinking, and also new types of ships. However, the most important ships that will be required to transform our industry will not be the ones that are operated autonomously or the ones propelled by ammonia or hydrogen. The two most important ships are readily available today, and they are leadership and partnership. Leadership. Our industry can and must lead the way in making the world a better place. From diversifying our fleets, to lowering our carbon footprints, to deploying digital technologies to manage our vessels more safely and efficiently, we can create a brighter future for our industry. And partnership. There has never been a better time to be in shipping. While the changes we see are exciting, we should remember that no man or woman or company, for that matter, is an island. 
working together, we can set new standards for what it means to be a mariner, what it means to innovate, and what it means to operate safely and responsibly. Thank you very much for your time today. Mark, thank you very much for your uh, industry leadership, for your insight, and for sharing your insight with us. Dear friends, let's enjoy lunch. Again, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming today. I'd like to thank the sponsors in particular, uh, the DNB team, and also the Capitaling team. We had a conference in London on September 12th, October 3rd in Athens, October 10th today in New York. October 23 will be in Shanghai. October 26, we're going to be in Tokyo, and the November 8, we're going to be in Munich, in Hamburg. So it's been, and of course we have. To, we were in Singapore in uh, in April. Uh, this is just the fall schedule. So thank you to all of you for giving us the opportunity to continue doing this. Thank you very very much. <laughs>